Well, welcome to what is anti-Semitism. Um, we're going to do a deep dive into the IHRA, IHRA, Jerusalem Declaration and Definitions of Anti-Semitism. Uh, we're going to be exploring issues such as freedom of speech and First Amendment rights related to issues such as if I criticize Israel or Palestine, support Palestinian rights or BDS, will I be defined as anti-Semitic? My name is Barbara Bearfield, and I have been a member of Jewish, Jewish Voice for Peace since the chapter was started in about 2006 in Detroit. Jewish Voice for Peace was started by three women in the Bay Area of California in the mid-1990s, and it has since grown to some 200,000 supporters worldwide and 60 chapters throughout the U.S. My childhood was spent in a predominantly Jewish community in Great Neck, New York, where, like many other Jewish kids, we learned about the horrors of anti-Semitism, whether it was from our grandparents who escaped to the U.S., from pogroms or from the Nazi Holocaust or the other attempts at an annihilation of the Jewish people. They came to the US to escape anti-Semitism, but found that it was still an ongoing, raw and an emotional experience, even in the US. And certainly one that continues to attack as we have seen in the rise of white supremacy movement in the US and worldwide. Anti-Semitism is defined in the dictionary as hostility to or prejudice against Jewish people. But we know that almost all of us have experienced some kind of ism in our lifetimes, bigotry, hatred, and oppression because of race, religion, gender, ethnicity, gender identity, sexual identity, the list is endless. Jewish Voice for Peace believes in a world where we are safe and cherished, a world without racism, without anti-Semitism, and without Islamophobia. JVP opposes anti-Jewish, anti-Muslim, and anti-Arab bigotry and oppression. We are more committed than ever to building a world where justice, equality, and dignity are accorded to all people without exception. And we deeply mourn the lives lost in the violent attacks, both Palestinian and Israeli in the last few days. Tonight, we will attempt to untangle a web of definitions and misunderstandings surrounding and fighting, fight, excuse me, fighting anti-Semitism. The two leading definitions of anti-Semitism now vying to when support are the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, the IHRA working definition and the more recent Jerusalem Declaration signed by over 200 leading intellectuals and scholars. Both definitions purport to explain what anti-Semitism is and what it is not, with each coming to very different conclusions about how anti-Semitism relates to Zionism and criticism of Israeli governmental policies. Adoption of either could extensively impact political debate, freedom of speech, and First Amendment rights in the US. As we explore anti-Semitism, we do this with the idea that it should not be isolated from other forms of hatred and oppression. We are honored to have with us tonight Rabbi Jeffrey Falek from the Birmingham Temple Congregation for Humanistic Judaism. He and his congregation are are actively locally and nationally in many social justice, justice efforts. A secular humanistic rabbi, he was appointed to lead the Birmingham Temple in July of 2013. Originally a member of the reform movement, Rabbi Falek became involved in secular humanistic Judaism in 2009 after a lifetime of searching and questioning. We are honored to have him as our moderator tonight continuing that searching and questioning and guiding. He also led JVP Detroit's recent webinar in December on what is the, is a two state solution dead. So I'm gonna turn it over to Rabbi Felig and thank you very much. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, welcome everybody. Um, actually, Barbara framed so much of what I had intended to say so well that it will leave us a little bit of an extra time 
for our panelists tonight. Um, uh, this, of course, is, a, is a, a time of year when we've just concluded the celebration of Ed al Fitr. And uh, I do want to acknowledge that tonight begins the holiday of Shavuot. Uh, Shavuos, for those of you with the Yiddish accent, uh, begins tonight and will be celebrated through Monday night or Tuesday, depending on your tradition. It is a celebration of learning. And thus, this evening's discussion is entirely appropriate in the spirit of this holiday, uh, which so many of us who are gathered tonight uh, are, are observing or at least uh, uh, make part of our Jewish heritage. And so for those of you who are, I wish you a good jantif, a happy Shavuot. To everyone else, I say thank you for being part of this important discussion uh, as we all come together to explore uh, this important issue. Current events notwithstanding, and Barbara made um, reference to those, this uh, this particular webinar was planned before uh, the events that uh, we've been witnessing unfold on our televisions uh, and in our newspapers recently. Uh, but it is not, of course, unrelated. Both of these statements, the IIHRA and the, uh, the so-called Jerusalem Declaration, uh, find many of their uh, differences in how they address the issue of whether or not to criticize and uh, uh, Zionism or Israel and, uh, and how uh, should be part of a definition of anti-Semitism. Um, I, for one, have, uh, have written about this and also in many of my, uh, my addresses to the congregation, some of you have been there, I've talked about the, uh, the necessity of concentrating much more on right-wing anti-Semitism because after all, with a rise in anti-Semitism in the world that we are witnessing, uh, there is no question that most of the violence and most of the, uh, the hatred has been emanating from the right. But uh, that said, it's, it is an important topic uh, to explore these two statements and even the question of whether we need statements. Um, I, would, uh, I would offer the, uh, the idea too that uh, there are pro-Israel people who engage in anti-Semitism. And I hope and expect that our commentary uh, will address that as well. Um, I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I'm skipping over my notes a little bit because Barbara almost wrote word for word what I did. So pardon my fumfering there for a moment, but I'm gonna get to our format now. Uh, so this is our format. We have allotted, or our organizers have allotted, five to ten minutes, and I hope it'll be ten, uh, for each of our four presenters. Um, I will do them the favor of timing it and then giving them a two-minute warning and then letting them know when the time is up, gently and uh, respectfully as possible. Uh, this will be followed by 30 minutes of uh, Q&A which we will uh, attempt, and you know, it's hard, it's hard in person, it's harder on Zoom. We will attempt to bring in everybody. And of course, I invite the, the panelists who can easily unmute and remute themselves to address questions to each other. And if, uh, if I happen to say, what do you think, uh, you know, Dr. Pensler, but somebody else wants to jump in with an answer, please know panelists that it's all welcome, but we are going to try to keep it to 30 minutes. We wanna respect folks' time. If you have a question as uh, one of the members of the audience, uh, because we have only one chat box, and I know you'll have many things to say to each other, uh, just to make Michael Friedman's job a little bit easier, since he's rooting these out, please write the word question, in caps would even be helpful, before, uh, before any question that you want addressed. He's going to be uh, transmitting them to my husband here, who's then going to turn his screen over to me. Uh, we had a lot of trouble last time we did this, getting this done. Uh, it's not as easy when you're not in person. So all of that sort of uh, formal stuff uh, behind us, I'm going to uh, introduce uh, the uh, panelists, each of them uh, now in order of their presentations, and then we'll turn to each of them in turn so we can have a, a good flow to the conversation. Uh, we will first be hearing from Renee Lichtman who uh, pointed out to the participants here that while he's speaking about the background of the HR, IHRA statement, which for those of you who don't know is the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance's statement, working definition of anti-Semitism as it were, which has been, uh, and, and Barbara, I will, I will insert this, has been adopted uh, by several states as legislation and has been used in that, uh, that uh, uh, executive statement by the former guy um, when it came to uh, applying it to uh, Title VI of the Civil Rights Court, which has had some effect on uh, speech on campus. And there is proposed federal legislation. I hope Barbara will address that, Barbara Harvey. Uh, but Renee will outline it for us and, and talk about it. Renee is a, a member of my congregation, of our community. He is a Holocaust survivor who helped start the Hidden Children and Child Survivors of Michigan. 
He is also a founding member of the World Federation of Jewish Child Survivors of the Holocaust. He has a PhD and is the recipient of a Fulbright scholarship uh, in painting. And he, as I said, will speak about the IHRA. We are honored tonight also to have with us Dr. Derek Pensler. Dr. Pensler is the William Lee Frost Professor of Jewish History at Harvard University. You guys didn't name low tonight with the, uh, with the panelists, did you? Dr. Pensler is president of the American Academy for Jewish Research, a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, and an honorary fellow of St. Anne's College, Oxford, also author of numerous books. He will be speaking about the Jerusalem Declaration of which he is a signatory. Uh, bringing it a little bit closer to home, but also with an international uh, reputation, uh, we will hear from Huweda Araf. Uh, Ms. Araf is a, uh, an attorney, a Palestinian American human rights attorney and activist, co-founder of the International Solidarity Movement, a Palestinian led organization, which uses nonviolence and direct action to resist Israel's colonization of Palestinian land. Ms. Oweda is a former chairperson of the Free Gaza Movement, which sailed the first boats into Gaza to confront Israel's blockade. And she will present a Palestinian perspective on anti-Semitism. And if you happen to see her disappear briefly from your screen, it's because she also has a, a, a happy occasion that she's celebrating with some family members. So I'll, I'll let you know about that in advance. And finally, we'll hear from, Dr., uh, from uh, Barbara Harvey, Esquire, attorney, uh, labor law and civil rights being her expertise. She is a member of the Free Palestine Committee of the National Lawyer Guild's International Committee. Uh, Ms. Harvey will speak about the lawfulness of the uh, anti-Semitism -defini anti definitions under the First Amendment, uh, which I referred to in a, a moment ago, and their impact upon the political debate within US academia about Israeli policies and practices towards Palestinians. And I would be remiss if I didn't say she shares my deep love for cats. So I will now begin this program by inviting uh, Dr. Lichtman uh, to present his remarks. Uh, thank you, Rabbi. Uh, I should just add that the, um, the State Department has accepted that definition of the IHRA uh, that's pretty important because the uh, IHRA is also considered or called a non-legally binding, but I think a lot of people are trying to make it uh, legally binding. It was initiated in, I think, uh, 2005, and it's a, a really complicated uh, document because it's, it's gone through so many uh, countries. Uh, I think I, I read over 30 countries adopted by uh, 18, depending on what you read and when you read it. Uh, so it's been adopted by a lot of countries. And in my reading, it, it sounds pretty uh, kind of lame. It's not, uh, you know, a real, um, uh, very controversial. It says, uh, here's the, what it says, the, that's the non-legally binding working definition of anti-Semitism implying that they're still working on it. Uh, quote, anti-Semitism is a certain reception perception of Jews, which may be expressed as hatred towards Jews, period. Rhetorical and physical manifestations of anti-Semitism are directed towards Jews or non-Jewish individuals or, and or their property towards Jewish community institutions and religious facilities. That's it. That one word about Israel, except when you get down to their following examples. So they've got um, uh, 11 examples. And I'm trying to be very objective in terms of describing it. They've got 11 examples. And six out of the exa 11 examples mention Israel. And that's where the uh, controversy comes in because those examples can be interpreted as uh, limiting free speech. And I'm not gonna go into each one of them. I'm gonna let other speakers do that. But I'll just give you an example also, the kind of language they always qualify in some of the examples, some of the writings, for example, here's one, one example. Uh, they'll say manifestations might include, there's always things like might, include the targeting of the state of Israel conceived as a Jewish collectivity. Now, I, 
I have a hard, hard time with Jewish collectivity. That's a, to me a state is is not comprised of individuals. It can be, but it's a state. It's different than 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 just Jewish people. But anyway, it says manifestations might include the targeting of the state of Israel, conceived as a Jewish collectivity. However, criticism of Israel is similar to that leveled against any other country uh, cannot be regarded as anti-Semitic. So they qualify that statement and there's a lot of that kind of qualification that goes on throughout. That's why it's very difficult exactly to figure out what, what they're saying. And I, and I hope the people that are attorneys, et cetera, that have more experience with that can, can, um, can make some comments. I think I'm gonna leave it at that. It's a very simple statement. The, uh, like I say, the, uh, the examples are the ones, contemporary examples of anti-Semitism in public life, the media, schools, the workplace, and the religious sphere uh, uh, could, taking into account the overall context. Uh, so the word context is also important. Uh, there are certain key words throughout these statements. Uh, context is very important. Uh, and there's other words like conflation, conflate, and uh, um, yeah. So I'll I'll leave it at that uh, for now. Now I was asked to also say something about my own experiences uh, as a Holocaust survivor um, uh, on anti-Semitism, and, it, and I I think it's very interesting because I was raised in in France um, uh, during the Holocaust. I was hidden and until 1950. So my experience with anti-Semitism was always religious anti-Semitism. Uh, you know, I discovered I was Jewish when the kids would call me a sad Juif, dirty Jew, during those um, Christian holidays or every week when, when the Jews were blamed for killing Jesus. So my understanding of anti-Semitism was always religious based. Little by little, uh, I think for many of us, you know, the, the state of Israel became uh, one, one of the issues and they were using the same term for, for the state of Israel, which I found uh, uh, difficult and, and still do. And I'll give an example of uh, a recent, relatively recent experience, which I think uh, clarified it for me. Uh, I was in uh, France a couple of years ago. This was after uh, this invasion of Gaza where some, uh, uh, 300, 300 Palestinian children were, were, were killed. Uh, and so I remember uh, being in Paris and with, with a relative and trying to uh, understand what, um, what was going on. And what I learned, what I figured out was that all the riots, so-called anti, so anti-Semitic riots by uh, the uh, Arab Palestinian community in Paris, uh, all those riots were, were not anti-Semitic. They were anti-Zionist, they were anti-Israel, but they were always called anti-Semitic. And a lot of the people who were out there in the streets had friends who were Jewish. They were from suburbs, working class suburbs around Paris, where they worked together. Some of them were uh, co-owners of stores together. They had businesses together. They didn't, the Palestinians, the Arabs didn't hate the Jews. They were trying to strike back at what was happening in Gaza. And the only way to do it was to sometimes attack synagogues, some of them, or go after synagogues. And it was interpreted as anti-Semitism, which I don't think it was. And I think conflating those two terms, uh, anti-Semitism and uh, anti-Zionism is a, a, a real problem. My, clearly, to differentiate, I would say the only anti-Semites that I know of a right-wing fascist, a right-wing fascist, the ones that are that are racist, that are against uh, women, Muslims, blacks, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and they are um, they are um, encouraged by people like Trump. They come out of the woodwork on times like Trump. Those are anti-Semites. The other people that are called anti-Semites are not anti-Semites. They are critics of the state of Israel. So when you hear about these poor Jewish students on campuses that don't know how to respond to these Arab kids who are friends, they're, they're, they're colleagues, they work together in schools, they're students, 
And those Arab kids have criticism of the state of Israel, but in, in the media, they're called anti-Semites, these Arab kids. They're not anti-Semitic. They're critical of the state of Israel. And those are the two categories that make it very clear for me. The real anti-Semites are fascists that hate everybody. They want a white Christian America. And the, the others are people that are called anti-Semites because there's no other term for them. And they are critics of, uh, of Israel policies, Israel behavior. And that's a very important term that we don't see too much. I think behavior should be important. And I think I'll stop at that. And I'd like to continue after you know uh, Q and A, or if I have some more time. Thank you. Thank you, Renee. I was just about to give you your two minute warning, and there you were wrapping it up. I will now turn it over to Dr. Pensler. Can you hear me? Great. Okay. We can. I've got my remarks here on my computer. Okay. I'm going to start by talking about what I think is is right as well as wrong with the uh, the IRA definition. So the IRA definition grapples with an important issue, um, and it did perform a vital service uh, by putting anti-Semitism on the agenda uh, for governments and for civil society organizations. But that does not mean that it is either perfect or deserves to be eternal. In fact, it's imperfect in many ways. So I want to talk about that a bit before I get to the JDA. First of all, and um, you know, Ray pointed this out, it's simply unclear. It's badly written. You know, um, uh, its definition of anti-Semitism at the very beginning is both too vague and too narrow. It says, you know, quote, anti-Semitism is a certain perception of Jews which may be expressed as hatred towards Jews. Well, in fact, anti-Semitism involves a wide range of feelings and actions. And on this point, the JDA is much sharper. The JDA begins, anti-Semitism is discrimination, prejudice, hostility, or violence against Jews as Jews. It's just clearer, sharper, easier to understand. Second, the IRA definition is vague when it comes to what sort of language about Israel is and is not anti-Semitic. Early on, the document claims, and I'm quoting, criticism of Israel similar to that leveled against any other country cannot be regarded as anti-Semitic. What does this mean? Does this mean that one could speak critically about Israel in any of the following ways? Well, in Canada and Spain, separatists have long called for the dissolution of the country. In the United States, many call the country structurally racist. There was widespread criticism of apartheid South Africa and a powerful global boycott movement against it. Russia, Iran, and Syria have been subject to international sanctions. The former Yugoslavia's leaders have been tried and convicted by the International Criminal Court. So this is criticism of other countries. So is the IRA saying that all of these forms of criticism and policy would be licit regarding Israel? The IRA doesn't say. It doesn't say, but its supporters have claimed that all of these forms of criticism would be anti-Semitic. The JDA, on the other hand, makes explicit that these sorts of critical expressions, when applied to Israel, are not anti-Semitic unless proven otherwise. Third point, the IRA claims that, quote, denying the Jewish people their right to self-determination, end quote, is anti-Semitic illustrating that claim via the accusation that the state of Israel is racist. But as I just said, other countries are called racist. So such criticism should, according to the portion of the definition I just quoted, elicit. But a lot of supporters of the IRIS say no. Also, self-determination and sovereignty are not the same thing. And I'll have more to say about that in a moment. Fourth, the IRA claims that it is anti-Semitic to apply quote, double standards by requiring of Israel a behavior not expected or demanded of any other democratic nation, end quote. Okay, does any other democratic nation maintain a 54-year-old occupation of millions of individuals who lack basic human rights, and that has, in violation of international law, settled hundreds of thousands of its own citizens in the occupied territory? If Israel is indeed held to the standards of democratic nations, isn't it inevitable that Israel's behavior will be found wanting? So let me now talk about how the JDA, I think, does a better job with these issues. And by the way, it's not 200 signatories, it's now over 300. Uh, first, the JDA offers relative clarity in its early sections. It has an extensive discussion of anti-Semitic speech in general and anti-Semitic speech about Israel, in particular in its second section. Because the JDA has gotten associated by supporters and critics alike um, 
as being largely about what is not anti-Semitic. Actually, most of the document is about what is anti-Semitic. And I really encourage everyone to read the documents. They're online, they're easily available, and you'll see for yourself. Second, the document's third section, which is its final section, makes an important contribution to the promotion of free speech within broad limits. The section asserts that support for forms of boycott against Israel, proposals for alternative political scenarios for the future of Israel and the Palestinians, and evidence-based criticism of Israel's past and present actions are not on the face of an anti-Semitic. Regarding boycotts, the IRA definition does not explicitly associate support for boycotts or sanctions against Israel as anti-Semitic, and yet supporters of the IRA definition routinely claim that the boycott movement is anti-Semitic. Why? Remember the German parliament recently passed a bill quoting the, referring to the IRA definition to say that the BDS movement is anti-Semitic. Now, does this make sense? There are Jews who boycott products from the occupied territories. Are they anti-Semites? According to Israeli law, support for such a partial boycott is no different than full-throated support for BDS in its entirety. Any of these behaviors can cause a non-Israeli citizen to be denied entry to the country. Does the IRA support such policies or oppose them? We can't tell because the IRA is so unclearly written. The JDA, on the other hand, explicitly defends the right of people to engage in and promote boycott activities if they so wish. The act of boycott becomes problematic only if it is accompanied by violence, threats, harassment, abuse, intimidation, or discrimination. As the JDA states right from the start, these actions are, if directed against Jews, as Jews, anti-Semitic. So yes, attacking a synagogue is anti-Semitic just as attacking a mosque is Islamophobic. Threatening and bullying Jewish and Muslim students, and both happen on campuses, are anti-Semitic and Islamophobic actions, respectively. Now, there's a lot about the BDS movement I don't like. I'm particularly concerned about its call to boycott Israeli academics. This component of BDS is, in my opinion, ill-conceived and ineffective. It has remarkably little support in North American academia. At no university in North America has anything even approaching 1% of the faculty and uh, postdoc uh, instructional staff signed a BDS petition, BDS boycott divestment sanctions, I should have clarified. Uh, the BDS movement has had little impact on faculty and STEM subjects, uh, technological subjects, the quantitative social sciences or the professional faculties. It has harmed professors of humanities and qualitative social sciences professors of literature, for example, or anthropology, people who are rarely responsible for the occupation and who quite often vigorously oppose it. However, a misguided action is not necessarily an anti-Semitic one. Similarly, there is no reason to tar the mere posing of alternatives to sovereign Jewish statehood as anti-Semitic. Throughout the history of Zionism in Israel, actors within the Zionist project and the international community have proposed many different forms of Jewish self-determination within Palestine. Borders and political arrangements between Jews and Arabs have been constantly contested. Today's Israel and the Palestinian territories are a welter of ill-fitting political elements. And as we've seen in the last week, they perpetuate oppression, resistance, and hatred. It is not inherently anti-Semitic to propose alternatives to the status quo, so long as the rights and freedoms of individuals and the rights of the collectives to live as it wishes the Jewish and Palestinian peoples within historic Palestine, the state of Israel and the territories are respected. Now, I myself am not optimistic that the alternatives to sovereign Jewish statehood that are being debated now by Palestinian activists and their supporters, such as a, a unitary democratic state or a binational state can work. I personally would have preferred a two state confederation as in the best interests of all parties, but I know how difficult the path to that end appears. It appears to be all but untraversable. But why would I deny the right to others to raise a point of view different from my own? Rights of free expression should only be limited if they're engaging in the kind of overtly hostile or discriminatory behavior described at the beginning of the JDA. The JDA also notes that well-grounded evidence-based arguments regarding Israel should not be construed as anti-Semitic. Again, the IRA is not explicit on this matter, but its vagueness regarding criticism of Israel and double standards leaves this entire issue up in the air. Is it anti-Semitic to criticize Zionism like any other form of nationalism as exclusive and prone to violence? Or to claim that Israel shares responsibility for the Palestinian Nakba of 1948, or even is entirely responsible 
for the Nakba. Now, I personally wouldn't say that Israel is entirely responsible for the Nakba, because even the most reputable scholars don't agree on that question. But can't we disagree with another perspective without calling it a form of hate speech? Supporters of the IRIS seem to think not. Why? So just um, to conclude, um, I have found that the IRA has been criticized quite sharply by uh, supporters of Israel. It also has encountered criticism from Palestinian community. We'll all hear from that in just a moment. Um, I just wanted to mention that Jews and Palestinians did work together on the JDA uh, document. Palestinians have been reluctant to make that involvement public for reasons that I think are quite understandable. Um, I also wanna mention that the JDA is not trying to suppress speech. I don't want the JDA to become kind of, to have statutory authority uh, as the IRIS seems to have assumed. I want it to be a thinking tool, uh, a way to help understand what is and is not anti-Semitic, but ultimately businesses, governments, universities, they have to make up their own minds. They have to come to decisions themselves about what kind of speech is and is not um, appropriate. Under American law, anti-Semitic speech, like other forms of racist speech can be legal, but there are settings as in universities where racist speech is not condoned. The JDA can be helpful as a thinking tool for these um, environments. Anyway, I'll stop there. Thank you, perfect timing. Thank you so much. And now we're going to turn to Ms. Araf uh, for a Palestinian point of view on this issue. Hi, thank you. Thank you everyone for being here. I mean, obviously a very important discussion that's happening at a very heavy time. And I must admit, I did not prepare any comments. I have been overwhelmed uh, in the past week um, to the extent that my six-year-old daughter was frustrated with me. And she told me that I did not deserve to have children because I was so focused on just uh, what's happening in Palestine right now. But I can, you know, without having prepared comments, just um, touch on a few things with regard to the IRA definition on anti-Semitism. First, uh, I, I wanna acknowledge that this definition is not necessarily new, but a, a culmination of a tactic that has been used for years and decades uh, against Palestinian rights activists. It's calling us anti-Semitic. Um, it has been a tool of censorship. And now what's happening with the IRA definition is this concerted attempt to get it institutionalized. So looking at it as a smearing tactic that has been going on for, for decades, I just imagine the incredible amount of time that's spent attacking people and attacking individuals uh, as opposed to actually trying to work on something that's constructive or listening to what people are are saying. And as far as the individuals, which was I was asked to talk about the, the Palestinian perspective and what it does to Palestinians, it is it forces a lot of Palestinians really to think twice about what they're saying and what the repercussions of that will be. And it's not just what we're saying. Of course, we all always need to think about what we're saying and uh, and think before we speak and act. But a lot of times it is Palestinians that are have to um, that are looking to relate our own experiences. What happened to my family? What is happening to my family now? And if I say it, or how can I say it? Am I going to be labeled anti anti Semitic in my place of work, in my school? And then, what is the consequences of that going to be? Am I going to be suspended? Am I going to be um, highlighted on the you know Canary Mission website, not be able to get a job after I graduate? And so it is. It, it almost denies Palestinians the, the right and the ability to be Palestinian and to relay our experience, the experience of being Palestinian. What is it like to live in our skin, whether we are here, whether we're in Europe uh, or anywhere and, and see our homeland demolished, seeing our friends terrified, seeing children being torn to, to pieces. Uh, can I talk about that without being labeled uh, an anti-Semite? And that I think is the heaviest part of, uh, of having a definition like this that specifically, okay, in the actual definition itself, it doesn't, it, it's unclear, it's a bad definition, it doesn't do that conflation, but the examples that are given are a great part of, uh, of the document 
itself that is used for guidance. And a lot of the examples that are given do conflate criticism of Israel and anti-Zionism with being anti-Semitic. So if I'm going to criticize Israel for a, a bombing children, I am being anti-Semitic. Uh, and that, again, that is the problem. So it creates this um, climate of, of fear. And even if we're not uh, on an individual level, fear, right, and self-policing, but also when you get to organizations and groups, we know that there are um, groups out there and, and lawfare organizations that have invested a lot of resources into fighting uh, Palestine advocacy on campuses specifically, but in other places. And so they're investing this time and money to go after individuals and to go after groups that don't have the same kind of resources, especially when you're talking about um, Students for Justice in Palestine on campuses, you know, and they're organizing talks, they're organizing events, and they oftentimes have to deal with the barrage that comes at their institutions and then the institutions tries to shut them down. But then they also have to worry about getting uh, singled out, sued even individually. And I just had one of my friends uh, just won a lawsuit, but it is being appealed. They tried to go after her for a Facebook post calling her um, anti-Semitic, and not even just, it's anti-Semitic, but also uh, trying to sue her for six, $6 million for, for defamation, again, on a freedom of speech issue. I, one thing I, I glossed over, but it might be important to mention is, I talked about this history of labeling Palestinians as, uh, and not even Palestinians, but Palestinians, Palestinian advocacy as uh, anti-Semites. And there has been a lot of accusations and they tried to tr get things shut down, et cetera. A lot of times it's the actually the, the Palestinian side, I think that that wins on the freedom of speech, on, on a freedom of speech grounds. The IHRA definition, when it's trying to, to conflate the boundaries between anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism, it's also, you know, working to conflate the boundaries between political activity and discriminatory activity. Uh, and so like we just heard, uh, discriminatory activity doesn't have that freedom of speech uh, protection in a lot of spaces. And it's that, I think the attempt to institutionalize this IHRA definition is to fill that gap that exists that generally works in favor of Palestinian advocates and being able to say this is a freedom of speech issue. No, now they want to label us as being discriminatory and anti-Semitic so that uh, on an institutional level, because what the IHRA definition does is force the, the uh, government when it's looking into accusations of anti-Semitism anti to use the IHRA definition. And so this, when institutions have this, that's what they judge also then uh, these, um, events or speeches on. And if you can then say, okay, this is anti-Semitism because of the criticism of Israel here. And so this is a form of discrimination, then you don't have that free speech protection. Uh, so on a strategic political level, that's what it's doing. On a practical level, it prevents Palestinians from being able to relay their own experience, Palestinian rights advocates from being, to, uh, being able to advocate freely without uh, you know, fear of these repercussions, which could result in also being sued for millions and millions of dollars. Uh, and even if, even if, you know, we know there's no basis, we're going to win this lawsuit, we're, it's still a, a tremendous amount of energy and resources that we don't usually have to put into defending ourselves. And on top of that, what it does is distract us from what we're really trying to do, which is advocate for the the life and human rights of, of our people, of the Palestinian people. Um, let me just, I don't know if I'm running out of time. I just wanna touch on two things or actually three things that were said before. And one of them being, you know, um, the definition itself talking about, or, or the, sorry, the examples of the definition talking about uh, singling out Israel. When we look at it, this accusation of constantly singling out Israel is not being done 
by us. We are not making Israel the exception. A lot of us human rights advocates stand up for human rights across the board. You know, if you're um, anti-discrimination, wherever you are, if you're for immigrant rights and black rights and LGBTQ rights, and we are for also Palestinian rights. And, you know, maybe I spend more of my energy here because I can't cover everything, but as a principle, I am for uh, everything. And so when we single, or when we talk about Israel, we're not singling out, what's happening is that Israel and its supporters are constantly demanding an exception for Israel. Israel shouldn't be singled out for its what it's doing to Palestinians because Israel is in a league of its own. From a legal perspective, the United States has laws which actually prohibit funds, US aid from going to commit massive human rights abuses, right? But Israel constantly gets an exception. They're not held to that standard. So we can send almost $4 billion a year to Israel and not investigate the way in which they're using US uh, funding to attack civilians and to commit human rights abuses. That's on the singling out Israel. But uh, a couple of things that were said on BDS, I didn't mean to talk about this, but Professor, BDS and the boycott of academics, it's not exactly that way. The, the BDS movement has a clear chart and guidelines on its website that you can, it's not meant to single out, it doesn't call for a boycott of individuals unless those individuals are advocates for or promote the, uh, or, or defend or are apologists for the state of Israel. So you're not boycotting Israeli academics, but if this academic is coming on a state-sponsored um, a state-sponsored program where it is benefiting from the occupation or it is coming as a propaganda tool of the state in, in which way, then yes, they, they can be boycotted. But where the BDS movement is not gonna call for a boycott of an academic that is actually anti-occupation and works against the occupation and oppression of the Palestinian people. And the last thing, because this was also a comment, um, even though it's not really the topic of our talk, but uh, on a, a two-state solution or what you're advocating for. It, it does tie into what we're talking about because myself, many of you know, I am an Israeli citizen, right? I have never thought that the two-state solution was acceptable because the two-state solution that is talked about is always Israel being a Jewish state where I will always be a minority where because Israel came to me and took over my land and now defines itself as a Jewish state, I have to accept being a citizen that is not uh, accepted like a, a fifth column or a barely tolerated minority in this state. I will never accept that. That is not just and that is why a two-state solution will never work for me. And if you're talking about a, a two-state solution where the state has equal rights for all of its citizens, and it is not a Jewish state, it is a state of all its people. And if you have a Palestinian state for all its people and an Israeli state for all its people, then there shouldn't be really a reason why we can't all live together. Um, but in talking about that, just to come back to the issue of, of policing speech, What's happening a lot of time is Israel, because it is, uh, from its very foundation, it wants a, a Jewish state for the Jewish people. And Jewish people have more rights than Palestinians. And sometimes I myself, when I want to post something, I want to point this out. I'm like, uh, uh, how do I say this? How do I say this was not saying Jewish exactly? But that's what it is. In Sheikh Jarrah, the state, uh, or these actually uh, settler organizations, but they're being backed up by the state and, and rubber stamped by the courts want to kick Palestinian families out of their homes so they can move Jewish families in. I feel terrible saying Jewish families, but they are. Uh, that's, that's the way the state has been using and manipulating the religion in a way a lot of times we have to point out that this is what it is. The state is for Jewish supremacy. I hate that we have to use that term, but, uh, and I think twice about saying, but that's exactly what it is. And sometimes I'm saying like, I, I feel like I need to police myself, but that's a result of the state manipulating the religion. And that's also what happens, you know, with these definitions. And even with the Jerusalem declaration, I think one of the criticisms from the boycott national committee uh, about the BDS national committee is that it continues to focus on Israel and Zionism as if anti-Semitism isn't really a, a much broader um, 
a, a much broader phenomenon that not, that's not just tied to Israel, Palestine and, and Zionism. And we should look at it this, that way as a much a broader phenomenon that's, it, that should be fought just like uh, racism is fought and Islamophobia is fought. It should be fought together and not singled out. And I'm sorry, I think I went on. I'll end there. And <laughs> you, it's OK. You did, you did go over I'm quite ranting. a bit. But, uh, but we had the luxury of time. And I'm very appreciative that you're here. I just want to point out one thing very personal uh, from my own perspective. I follow Hoeda on uh, on Twitter. And uh, I, I can tell you that uh, in advocating for her own people and for her own positions, I have never detected a scintilla of anti-Semitism, nothing that even rhymes with anti-Semitism. Um, but uh, we'll get into that more with questions and comments later. I will turn it over to Barbara now, who will have a, uh, I think, a, a legal analysis of the uh, use of IRA and the other declaration as well. Yeah, um, um, uh, I, I've had a personal friendship with Huweda, and I can tell you there is not an ounce of anti-Semitism, whatever. Uh, and I have not found, in fact, anti-Semitism in any of the Palestinian friends that I've made, uh, interestingly. Um, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to try to put the definitions <clears throat> in the context of a of a legal analysis, which has to be a First Amendment analysis, because that's what pops out, of course, as the as the uh, the ruling consideration. Um, the Jerusalem Declaration uses what I have always understood to be the historical definition of anti-Semitism, uh, without saying all the words of the Jerusalem definition. It boils down to hatred of Jews based upon the ident their identity as Jews. Uh, but speech does not necessarily lose its constitutional protection because it is bigoted or even because it amounts to hate speech. In fact, the ACLU, the National ACLU's probably most famous case of all cases uh, was in Skokie where there was a, you know, a post-World War II march in Nazi uniform um, by white nationalists. And uh, the Jewish community in the United States was just horrified uh, by it. Um, and the Supreme Court used the case that came up to it about uh, the right of people to march down public spaces in full Nazi regalia, um, spewing anti-Semitic hate speech and the Supreme Court said, yes, it does. Uh, and it, it did that based upon an ACLU brief, which almost destroyed the ACLU permanently, um, which advocated for that outcome. And uh, it turned out, I think, to be the ACLU's most valuable asset in the long run, because what it did was it demonstrated the integrity of the ACLU in coming out with this incredibly tough position right after the war had ended or soon, a few, you know, shoot, not that long after the war ended. So uh, that principle that the Supreme Court uh, established in Skokie very dramatically remains the, the law under the First Amendment. The First Amendment does not prohibit hate speech at all. Um, there are Civil Rights Act that prohibit anti-Semitism when it affects uh, employment between, actually, yes, employment between an employer and employee. Uh, religion is not made a basis for discrimination under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, which is the uh, title that uh, uh, lets schools receive federal funding. And um, that was to specifically to allow money to go to religious schools as well as non-religious schools. But that's the way it is. So uh, all of the work done to create uh, the definition focused on coming up with a definition that would succeed in becoming a weapon to defund schools under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act <clears throat> by basically uh, uh, categorizing anti-Semitism as ethnic-based discrimination instead of religious-based discrimination. Uh, and I can report now that 
after much litigation by Palestine Legal, there was one outcome of the many, many cases that it took on that upheld a law using uh, that definition of anti-Semitism. And that was struck down by the Court of Appeals more, uh, quite recently as unconstitutional. Because hate speech, you know, particularly in this context in which it arises, is political speech, and no speech is more protected on First Amendment than political speech. It receives more protection than all other speech. The only basis on which it is not protected is the same uh, uh, grounds for destroying protection of other protected speech. Defamation, which is speech, is not protected. Pornography is not protected, if you can prove it's pornography. And uh, speech that, pre that presents an imminent danger of serious bodily injury is not protected. And the classic example illustration of that principle is yelling fire in a crowded theater where you cannot get the police there or the fire trucks there in time to put out, you know, the fear in people's minds that are that is causing a mob to trample other people to death as they try to exit the theater. That is the classic illustration of uh, speech that is neither defamatory nor pornographic that uh, uh, still may be prohibited. Political speech, no matter how offensive, is constitutionally protected. So speech that falls within the definition, any definition of anti-Semitism does not thereby lose its First Amendment protection. And <clears throat> under that analysis, the IHR definition is clearly unconstitutional, very clearly unconstitutional, um, because it prohibits through, the, through an illustration criticism of the state of Israel. And it doesn't matter what you criticize the state of Israel or, or the United States or any state for, for anything, it is protected political speech, even though it is hate speech. So it is unconstitutional uh, under the First Amendment. The IHRA definition is clearly unenforceable if it is enacted into law as it has been in more than 30 states um, and a, a presidential policy under Trump and uh, a State Department policy. But it is on, in the final analysis, it is unenforceable legally. If it's enforced, it's going to be declared unconstitutional and has been in many of these uh, forums. And in no case currently, has there been a contrary ruling despite the large number of cases that have litigated the issue? So this is where we're get, what we're talking about is the core of free speech under the US Constitution, the most important aspect of the Constitution. And it is going to be quite the case that persuades the Supreme Court to mess with that. I don't think it's gonna happen anytime soon and particularly not with this issue. And what I have told lawyers in the National Lawyers Guild as a result of all this is, so don't worry about it. <laughs> if someone wants to sue for your violations of this act, um, that's their problem. They have to win the lawsuit. They're not gonna win it, which has been the case in case after case after case after case that has actually been filed. Uh, so that should give everybody a very different attitude toward engaging in speech which crosses the line into a violation of the IHRA. And I think the Jerusalem Declaration, it seems to me, was largely intended to re respond with a more realistic uh, presentation of the con concept of anti-Semitism that does not so blatantly trample on, on, on free speech principles as the IHRA definition does. 
But the bottom line analysis is that insofar as the Jerusalem Declaration itself prohibits hate speech, that is anti-Semitic speech, it is not a basis for invalidating the, the law or the, or the action that is claimed to violate uh, free speech. It is not, it is still protected. Uh, so <laughs> its biggest impact, the IHRA, I think, is that it has had a tremendous chilling effect on the on on campus uh, speech, under uh, uh, when it comes to criticism of Israel and uh, of fearing the risk of discipline, for example, as a student, if you engage in that kind of speech. So the chilling effect is notable, but the legal impact is virtually zero. And uh, just, you know, keep that in mind. <laughs> so schools receiving Title VI funds are violating the rights of students under the First Amendment if they try to prohibit anti-Semitic speech as defined under the IHRA. Or also under the Jerusalem Declaration insofar as it is still speech and does not fall into those three categories I identified earlier. Uh, it would have to be speech, you know, the likeliest candidate, speech presenting some imminent danger of um, serious bodily harm, like uh, violent a reaction by Stand with us, for example, is a group that comes to mind that I think is capable of violence if provoked. And uh, if it looks like that's happening, then that particular incident may not be protected depending on what was said. If what was said was perfectly reasonable, then the problem was that the response to it was what was unlawful, not the speech. Not the speech, but the response to the speech is what was unlawful. So I think I am going to stop there and uh, hope to flesh it out uh, in the Q&A. Thank you, Barbara. Um, you certainly uh, addressed a, a lot of the things that uh, we already had in our pre-written questions. Um, <laughs> I, I have a, a little observation and I'll throw it open to, uh, to anybody, although I'm particularly interested in yours and Dr. Pencil's reactions. Excuse me. When I worked as a Hillel director years ago at the University of Illinois, we had some very serious anti-Semitic uh, behavior that happened uh, from some right-wingers neo-Nazi self-proclaimed. Today I receive fundraising notes from them constantly and it all seems to have to do with Israel. Um, so in addition to the chilling effect, and maybe I'll start with Dr. Pensler, uh, this seems to, to sort of be ingraining itself into the, uh, into the Jewish life uh, as particularly on campus, that, that the, uh, the, the definition of what it means to, to be persecuted as a Jew is that someone advocates for Palestine. Curious about your reaction to that. And maybe Barbara, you could address also the chilling effect as well as our other panelists. Uh, Dr. Pencil, do you have any comment on that? Well, it's hard to, for us to you know, put ourselves back in the heads of a 20 you know, year old. Um, <laughs> the... <clears throat> The fact is that a lot of the conversation, which I wish it were conversation, it's often yelling and screaming between students who are pro-Palestinian and pro-Israeli, pro it might not cross the line, any of those legal lines, you know, Barbara, that you were talking about, it doesn't. But it certainly has a traumatizing effect and it has a traumatizing effect on, on, all, the, on all the students. You know, so I spend a fair amount of time with the students at Hillel at Harvard and they're a, they're a bright bunch. And they're, they're bright students and they tend to be pretty progressive politically, <clears throat> but they, they get quite bruised you know, they start talking with someone and this person finds out that they've lived in Israel or they have some connection with Israel and they immediately come under a barrage of criticism. Now, does that person have the right to issue the criticism? Of course they do, they absolutely do. But the students feel quite bruised. And you might say, well, what does the bruising matter? I mean, people are dying in Palestine and in Israel. Um, I'm just talking about the life of a university and what's the best way to promote civilized conversation. I completely agree with Barbara that there's a very high threshold in the States 
for prohibited speech. But remember, the JDA and the IRA are international, and there are a lot of countries in the world that do not have the American um, untrammeled free speech sort of doctrines. Canada, I'm just across the border. We have hate crime legislation. Uh, there is a crime called willful promotion of hatred. <clears throat> I've been involved in prosecutions uh, on, on this uh, issue. Uh, Germany and Austria have uh, hate crime, so hate crime speech and so on. So this is not just an American issue. Uh, and, but you're talking about the situation in American campuses where no, it's not, it's rarely crossing a legal line, but there are subclinical maybe to, or sub actionable forms of uh, tension, of um, emotional drama or whatever that have a negative effect on students on all sides of the political um, spectrum. And I believe that a statement like the JDA, which should never become a basis for policy ever, and I agree with Barbara completely on that, but just a statement like this that university administrators can have in mind to say, you know, if a student wants to say something anti-Semitic, we can't stop them from saying it, but do we really have to sponsor an event that is overtly, let's say, Islamophobic or anti-Semitic? The answer is no. Universities do have the right um, uh, to, you know, withhold or to, or to provide sponsorship for certain activities. So this is where I think the JDA can be very helpful, um, perhaps more than definitely more than the uh, than the IRA. But you're right. This is this is not. We're not talking about actionable speech. We're talking about something less than that. But it still has a it still has a, a bunch of negative effects. Uh, Renee, you have a comment to uh, to add. Yes, I, I wanted to point out. Uh, uh, I asked Michael to put this uh, article. Uh, in the chat, it's Jewish federations with an S, Jewish federations urge Biden to promote controversial definition of anti-Semitism. It's the magazine is Jewish Currents and the date is December 10th, 2020, just a few months ago. Uh, and uh, in this article, the Jewish federations of North America is lobbying the incoming Biden administration to broadly apply, quote unquote, broadly apply the controversial International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance working definition of anti-Semitism across the federal government, according to the group's memo listing its recommendations for Biden. So this is Jewish federations. And then it goes on in this article to mention specifically the fact that South Carolina and Florida have passed bills requiring state universities to use the IRA definition to regulate campus discrimination complaints. And groups associated with the right-wing philanthropist Adam Milstein are lobbying Facebook to adopt the full IRA definition, including the examples, those examples again, involving Israel to define hate speech on the platform. Thank you. Thank you. That actually speaks exactly to the point that um, that Barbara and uh, and uh, Derek were making. Um, we've had a number of questions that are sort of a, in, in a similar vein. I'll just throw them out there to any and all of you uh, about uh, whether or not, um, well, particularly the Jerusalem Declaration, but whether and how it addresses the phenomenon of both pro, uh, well, pro-Israel, pro-Israel anti-Semitism, which is something we made reference to earlier. Uh, many evangelicals and so forth uh, are um, <laughs> sort of uh, at their root uh, expressing a sort of medieval anti-Semitism, religious anti-Semitism, even with their support of Israel. So I want to throw that out there to anybody who wants to, to grab hold of that. I'm happy to respond, but I would... Okay, I'll go first quickly. Go ahead, go um, ahead. I don't know, there's a film I'd like to recommend, maybe you've seen it called <laughs> Till Kingdom Come. It came out a few months ago. And it is a film about evangelical Christian connections with Israel. And in a way, it doesn't say anything that we don't already know, but it illustrates it extremely well. And I mean, I think it's hard to put that kind of mentality within the language of, let's say the JDA or any statement on anti-Semitism, because these are people, first of all, I mean, religious freedoms, they have the right to believe what they believe. And if they want to give money to Israel and you know a funnel charity to Israel, they have the right to do that. Their motives are, in my view, deeply suspect, uh, but I don't see how that can be or should be um, uh, policed in any way. 
And also, I don't know what's going on at the more religiously oriented colleges and universities in the United States. My career has been at secular research universities where that student element is not as politically active as say the Jewish pro-Israel students and then the pro-Palestinian uh, students, regardless of their, of, 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 of their origin. It just hasn't been that big of an issue, uh, but it might be a very big issue at more religiously oriented colleges throughout the United States. Anybody else want to come in on that? I maybe want to throw in also the element of internationally pro, uh, well-known pro-Israel, so not just within the evangelical world, but for instance, the leader of, uh, of Hungary, who is uh, known to be very pro-Israel. Um, so uh, again, I'll open that to all of the panelists. Uh, there's, there's an anti-Semite <laughs> that I don't think anybody can deny. Um, I don't want to do all the talking. I'll just be very brief. I mean, Victor Orban. Uh, you're, you're, you're the one with the professor of Jewish history uh, well, uh, yeah, title. So. <laughs> other people who work for a living. So, um, you know, whether it's Victor Orban or other populist leaders, yes, they maintain traditional views of Jews as a financial cabal and conspiratorial and all of that. And they actually like Israel as a model of a kind of ethno-national um, state. I've had experiences in Hungary where I've been approached by supporters of the Yobik party, which is a right-wing extremist party. And they were extremely pro-Israel uh, because they said, this is a state that, you know, it has an army and it uh, is surrounded by enemies and it fights for its own, um, for its own ethno, uh, uh, you know, its ethnic identity. Uh, but again, you know, I think what the IRA in its admittedly, uh, mistaken ways and what the JDA is trying to do is deal with problems of um, negative interactions between Jews and non-Jews in the United States, primarily otherwise it's in Western Europe, right? The IRA was signed by people from Canada, what is it, US, Canada, Britain, Germany. So we're talking about those circumstances um, and not let's say East Central Europe, which is something very different. I'm sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. I have my own little mute button here. Um, there, there were some questions that were asked earlier about the usefulness of such statements in general. Um, clearly, uh, as um, as Awed has has remarked, the uh, the IRA in particular, and the fact that it's being used as a as an instrument of uh, legislation. Um, causes a chilling effect, but uh, is there some positivity to having a statement like the uh, like the Jerusalem Declaration? Does that help us in our intergroup social justice work? That was one question that was posed earlier. Wow, well, the sun is bright. Huh? The sun is bright. Something's probably wrong. I, I don't know who Renee is, but if you could mute yourself, I think Barbara, you were going to speak. Go ahead. <laughs> I was. Um, uh, I, I think that um, it is useful to have the uh, Jerusalem Declaration because it clearly defines anti-Semitism. And I think it's a, a useful definition. It doesn't go too far. It's not complicated. Um, it doesn't stray from the, from the goal of defining anti-Semitism um, in a few words. What I want to make clear, though, is that there is a big difference between having a tool that defines anti-Semitism and having it, having a tool, having, turning speech into a weapon that you then think you can use to start creating consequences flowing from speech that falls within the parameters of that definition. Speech, the speech, the definition of anti-Semitism, you know, in the Jerusalem Declaration is clearly um, hate speech. That's what's prohibited. It's, it's uh, anti-Semitism um, clearly defined. That doesn't mean that it can be legally banned because it is still speech and it is, and hate speech, as I said, is protected. Now, no school relishes the thought of saying, sorry, we can't help you if someone is standing on a stage spewing what is really hate speech. It's disgusting, 
but that doesn't mean that that it's a weapon to be used as though it were a law. Once this definition is turned into a law, a law to what? To state a definition or a law that carries with it consequences. If there are consequences, then it, those, the law is unconstitutional. Can I say something real quick? Um, Please. I don't want something that I said in, in Barbara's presentation to be uh, confusing because I talked about institutionalizing this definition as a way to make up for this gap that exists um, that allows kind of cases to be found in favor of Palestinian rights activists because they are free speech issues. Um, when when Trump signed, you know, the executive order uh, institutionalizing this uh, IRA definition, I mean, now as it stands, when there are criticism or complaints made at institutions, uh, the government in investigating them are supposed to use this definition now to determine whether it's uh, whatever that was complained of is actually anti-Semitic. And in a whole range of cases where things are talking about Israel, it's going to fall according to this definition, more likely on the side of yes, it's anti-Semitic based on this IRA definition. And that becomes problematic for the institution. And so while Barbara is absolutely correct in saying obviously that it's not uh, illegal, it would require then, uh, you know, to, to go around and, and uh, win the battle in the courts, it would require really the Palestinian side or the side that is on the Palestinian advocacy to challenge that in the courts, right? And that's what I was talking about, uh, it, the, the resources and tying up the resources of activists uh, and institutions or groups that don't necessarily have the same kind of resources. So like to, to give an example, if a, a complaint was lodged with an institution and then the federal government comes in and investigates uh, what not, or or the institution then says based on this definition you can't have this event etc and shuts down the event it would be on then the Palestinian student group as students versus Palestine or whatever to then launch this kind of of challenge and then that becomes the you know the preoccupation and I mean don't get me wrong sometimes initiatives like this can be educational tools in and of themselves but right now it does exist as a problem the the, def the IRA definition uh, has been adopted, and until and so the effort now is to get the Biden administration to overturn that executive order. And at the same time, I mean, you have it. We had a meeting with the State Department last week. Um, the uh, sorry, the National Lawyers Guild. We put out a memo on all of Biden's policy, uh, all of Trump's policies, and and calling on the Biden administration to change course. And one of the things that we pointed out and to the State Department official is that you have this definition right up on your website. I mean, this is problematic in and of itself. And so it is right now being promoted by the government. It is right now law until it's overturned and overturning it is going to require a challenge in the courts or, um, or right now what people are, I think advocates are pushing for what the National Lawyers Guild is pushing for in our group is to, um, basically uh, overturn this executive order as we're hoping Trump will over, uh, Biden will overturn a lot of Trump's executive orders. So that's, um, I think that's where it continues to be problematic. And I think, uh, unless I'm understanding Barbara, Barbara, your presentation wrong, uh, you know, you're saying it doesn't have legal teeth, but in a sense it, right now, it can shut down speech, right? Unless the Palestinian advocates take it to court. It's a tool of harassment, in other words. Um, it's a tool uh, of wait, intimidation you... and coercion to prevent yes. uh, speech in favor of Palestinians is what it is. Is is there is there some uh, some movement that can that can happen if it's not already happening uh, for some more mainstream civil rights organizations or more broad based, I should say, civil rights organizations like ACLU to uh, lend some of their massive resources to this issue. 
the ACLU has been terrific on this issue. It has been very active in many of the cases. It has been the lead, uh, uh, the legal lead in the litigation. And uh, without the ACLU's work, I, I doubt that this movement would have had the resources to carry the load of all the different cases that uh, exactly. were needing litigation. Sorry, uh, let me, can I ask you to clarify, Barbara? I'm sorry. They have been <laughs> terrific on anti-BDS legislation. Have they done yeah. stuff on I IRA? Yeah, I haven't seen anything on IRA necessarily challenged yet. I could be, I, I've seen Pal Legal take up the stuff with some universities, but I haven't seen them in the in the courts necessarily, but on BDS, anti-BDS legislation, yes, ACLU has been phenomenal. And on, on colleges and university campuses that are taking disciplinary action, for example, against faculty for staging events that uh, uh, are for the are focus, fo for the purpose of presenting a Palestinian perspective. Um, Many such events have been canceled by panicked administrations. And that is about the use of this definition of anti-Semitism. And the ACLU has come in in many of those cases and has really led the way in establishing the now completely unmarred record of victories, legal victories on this issue. There is no contrary legal authority anymore. So we have time, I think, maybe for at least one more question. Um, and I don't remember where it was in my little lineup of questions here, but it related to how the effect that these statements, um, and this I think all of you uh, may have something to say, the effect that these statements have on, uh, on reporting on the Palestinian uh, point of view uh, in America particularly, because that's where the statement um, seems to have gotten the most legislative backing. Um, do, do you, for instance, Dr. Pensler, believe that there's a, a way to promote the Jerusalem Declaration to some of our larger uh, media outlets uh, to, uh, to sort of eclipse the IRA statement? Well, the JDA uh, was very well, it, it was a very well prepared statement and, and they, they've got quite a publicity sort of apparatus and there have been articles about the JDA in um, news outlets all over the world. I mean, in Germany, it made the major newspapers, Die Zeit and the Frankfurter Allgemeine, it made um, newspapers in the UK and the United States. Now, it's also attracted a lot of criticism in those same media outlets. In fact, sometimes quite nasty. And what's interesting is vicious ad hominem cr criticism. Whereas the JDA said, look, the IRA is wrong for X, Y, and Z reasons. And in return, uh, there have been these vicious articles accusing signatories of the JDA of being craven, cowardly, um, people trying to simply be good Jews. You talk about anti-Semitism being quote, good Jews or in Hebrew, Yehudon, the, the, the little Jew trying to win um, the favor of left-wing um, Israel hating uh, academics whom we allegedly are all cravenly sort of, you know, bowing to. It's quite, it's quite vicious. But the important thing is that it's hitting a nerve. And uh, so it is getting attention. And I think it was five or six US Congress uh, representatives were going to bring the JDA, I think it was last week, to Secretary of State Blinken and to talk about this. So I think that it is getting traction. And one reason why it's getting traction, and with this I want to say something to Huayda, it's really important that if you read the beginning of the JDA, it, it says quite explicitly that anti-Semitism is absolutely part of the general problem of racism and homophobia and other forms of discrimination, and this is a common struggle. And I think this is something at this moment in American history that is particularly important. And uh, that's something that the JDA authors and signatories really care about. And I think it, it will get it more, more press and, 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 and deservedly so. Thank you. Anybody else want to weigh in on the utilitarian uh, uh, the, the features of the, uh, of the Jerusalem Declaration? Well, we didn't, we, uh, people should not be surprised that uh, we didn't have tons and tons of questions because we actually had, uh, for instance, I received 12, uh, pr uh, 12 questions that were prepared in advance and all of you addressed in one way or another, all of the issues. I think this was a very far ranging conversation. Um, I think that this is a model. Uh, I don't know if it's where we are, although Dr. Penciler isn't here with us, but uh, there's, there does seem to be some, um, some uh, a special civility uh, at least among some circles on these issues. And I personally wanna thank uh, all of you for participating in this tonight. And uh, I think being a model of rational
national discussion about this issue. Our minds and, uh, and hearts, of course, are all with those who are suffering right now. Um, the suffering doesn't doesn't necessarily end when this particular round ends, but uh, the death and destruction is uh, is certainly uh, is certainly in, in uh, preoccupying us. And so uh, I know that we're, we're thinking about that very deeply. And uh, despite the fact that it's difficult to have a Chag Sameach, a good yantif, a happy holiday during this, I hope that those who are celebrating will. Um, I will now turn my uh, duties over to, uh, to Barbara to, uh, to wrap it up. You are still muted, Barbara Bar Barfield. Okay, there we go. Hey. Okay, so I want to thank everybody for being with us tonight. And especially I want to thank our co-sponsors, the Birmingham Temple for Con Congregation for Humanistic Judaism, the Cone Hadow Center for Judaic Studies, Huntington Woods Peace Group, JVP Mid-Ohio, Meta, Meta Peace Team, the Michigan Coalition for Human Rights, Peace Action for Michigan, Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, the Detroit chapter, and um, Jewish Voice for Peace, again, is the organization that helped to present this. And uh, I want to thank our panelists. I especially want to thank Rabbi Jeffrey Falick for helping to moderate and keep us on track and really help illuminate some of the many questions and confusions about uh, this term anti-Semitism and the implications of definitions, um, what that might, and Barbara, thank you so much, and Howeda, everyone for sharing with us so much important information about this. Um, so I want to thank our panelists. So uh, Renee Lichtman, Derek Pensler, Howeda Araf, and Barbara Harvey, thank you so much for being here. So this Webinar was presented by Jewish Voice for Peace. Jewish Voice for Peace members are inspired by Jewish traditions to work together for peace, social justice, equality, and human rights. We respect international law and a US foreign policy based on these ideals. Again, I wanna express our grief and, our, and mourn the deaths that are happening right now. And I also want to wish um, a happy Shavuot to all those who are honoring it tonight, celebrating it tonight, and remembering that I think, and Rabbi, you can correct me, this is honoring the, um, the Jews were given, or Moses was given the Ten Commandments. And well, one of as, the most as we humanists would say, the legend of the receiving of the right, Torah. The legend, but the, the moral of this <laughs> and the thing that we all need to think about is, and this is what we were taught from childhood on, thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not take from thy neighbors. So we need to keep those moralistic, those, those visions and that in our hearts and in our actions and in our lives. So with that, I will say thank you to everybody and have a wonderful night. Oh, wait, one more thing. <laughs> I just wanted to, I'm gonna put in the links um, information about Jewish Voice for Peace. So our Jewish Voice for Peace Detroit chapter meets once a month, the third Monday of every month on Zoom at seven o'clock. If you email us, and I'm gonna put it in the chat, you can um, find out more about it. You can also become a member of JVP. And that link is also in the chat as soon as I hit the return button. And with that, I will now say good night and thank you and peace. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.